Good afternoon, friends and neighbors. Happy Friday to you. This is Bruce Harpence coming to you live from the launch of iPhone 13 with another networking video. This week uh, and the series coming up will be from the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching. So we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff that has to do with forwarding packets or frames from one place to another. This week we're going to cover Chapter 1, which is sort of general strategies. But without uh, much further ado, let's get started. At this point, I'll be going on the assumption that you already get stuff like ARP and IP, some equipment, subnetting, masking, sort of how things go together and the building blocks of a network. So when I start talking about routing tables, it's just easier if we don't have to talk through all that stuff. All right, now layer two, we generally consider to be an Ethernet, token ring, 802.11 sort of thing. And usually we'll mention things like frames and switches when we're talking about layer two. Layer three is when we move to IP version four, IP version six, and of course, routers. But the thing that confuses things these days is that Devices don't seem to differentiate too much between layer 2 switching, in a traditional sense, and layer 3 routing. Because now we have this thing called a multi-layer switch. So a multi-layer switch is the device that embodies both the switching elements that we've come to know and love and the capabilities of a router. Now, I also want to make the distinction that multi-layer switching for most people seems to mean routing between VLANs. And while that is a capability, there's a lot more to multi-layer switching than just forwarding frames between VLANs or having a switch that does routing. There's a lot more about understanding the topology for a multi-layer switch. So our first stop is going to be the hosts. Anytime you're going to start generating traffic on a network, it comes from a client or a host. And so the client or the host makes a lot of decisions long before the traffic hits the switches and routers and access points. Most of these decisions are made in what we call the host routing table. And so this is an example of one here. And you can see that if, in this case, there's an awful lot of addressing that has to happen. Now I'm going to mention tables here in a little bit, but this table here works in conjunction with things like the ARP table to decide what kind of traffic hits the network. So long before stuff ever hits the network, we have to process the host routing table. Chapter 2 and one of the next videos will talk all about this particular table and how we process it. Okay, tables, 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 tables. Uh, one of my favorite things to say to folks that are learning about networking is that almost everything can be followed by reading through the tables. Every network device and um, every network client has a collection of tables that it uses to forward traffic or to make decisions. So if we take the example of a transmission that is leaving your network, it starts off with a host routing table. It might hit the host ARP table. Eventually it'll hit a, a network element like a switch that has a source address table or what we might call a MAC address table. Eventually it gets to a router the router processes its routing table. The router also has an ARP table. If we had wireless in there, we would have access point association tables. And then it finally gets to the destination. Then the whole process would start over again, moving back the other way to the original source. Now the fun thing about this is that depending on the configuration of your device, you can have lots and lots of different tables. So for example, if you give a switch an IP address or an access point an IP address, it also now has an ARP table. So there you have it. So if you just spend a little bit of time taking a look at these tables, you can understand a lot about how networks operate and how traffic gets forwarded. All right, so let's actually start to connect some network segments together. So here I've given you a very small topology, a couple of routers, a couple of switches, nothing really, really big or complicated here. But we do have to notice that once we added the two routers in there, this actually creates three networks. Now the routing tables of the routers have been expanded here. And so you can see 
that in order to be complete, in order for a host on either end of this topology to get to the other host, the routers have to know where all three of these networks are. In addition, we can now give this a name. Because I manually configured the routers, this becomes what we call static routing. And you can see that in the routing tables, we have the little letter C there in a Cisco router. That means it's directly connected. And the little letter S means a static routing table entry. Now, static routing is very nice. It's very fast. It's very clear what's happening. But the problem with static routing is that it's very manual also. So once these routers believe they know where the destinations are, if anything changes in the topology and there's a break somewhere, the traffic cannot reach the destination. Now for small topologies, static routing is the way that you want to go. So we actually see it used quite a bit, both for destination networks and also for default routing, which we'll talk about here in a second. But one of the things that I want to mention real quick here, and, and a common mistake, is the static routing oops of using the interface. So the top line here is the correct way to go about this. So if you say IP route, network destination, destination mask, and then the forwarding router's IP address. And if you were looking at the previous topology, you will have noticed that the two uh, interfaces in the middle of the topology were 2.254 and 2.253. So the routing tables were updated accordingly. The oops that is sometimes made is that you can put in that last field an interface such as the one that I've indicated here. Now the reason that this is the wrong thing to do is because it's completely ambiguous. It doesn't tell the router where it's actually supposed to forward traffic. So in the topology that you see on this page the router that is sending the traffic out would have no idea which router it's actually supposed to send it to. So it's very simple to create problems for a command like that. And the lesson here is that not only is this the incorrect way to go about this, but also that just because a command can be completed doesn't necessarily mean that it should be. All right, now my good friend and colleague John Weissman, who, by the way, is a networking animal. If you have a chance to take a class with him, you should likes to be even more specific than I am. And he will add a command like this. So at the very bottom here, we have the network destination and the mask of that destination, the IP address of the forwarding router, but also the interface that you want to use it. And what this does is it clears up any additional confusion about where that forwarding router's interface can be found. Default routing is an example of a static route. Now the reason that we need a default route is because there are lots and lots of times where we have to get to a destination, we give it to a router, and the router has no idea how to get there. Or the host isn't directly connected to that destination either, and so it needs to have a router to send all this miscellaneous traffic to. The default routers are identified by these destination and mask entries of all zeros. And the reason that this works is because they match everything. If you and all zeros with a mask of all zeros, you get all zeros. And so that's a match for everything. So in routing tables, we often see that we're anding the first column with the second column in the case of this host here. The default route is added in similar fashion to a static route. You can see an example here. Now on this page, I've also got the warning not to confuse these entries 0000 with the IP address 0000. So the, the common use is with a default route, but it's also possible to put in an IP packet, not in a table, the IP address of all zeros. Now the question is, where would you use that? Well, the example that I'm giving you here is DHCP. And on this particular page, we've got the actual packet that would be an indication of where you would use all zeros. The basic problem with DHCP goes like this. I have to get an IP address from a DHCP server. The DHCP server is on the network. In order to communicate with the DHCP server, I need an IP address. But I can't communicate unless I have an IP address. So how do I solve this conundrum? 
And the answer is that I use all zeros. All hosts do this. And so when they spin up their initial connection, they generate IP packets with themselves listed as an IP address of all zeros. Now the frame, the layer two frame that we use to encapsulate this particular thing is a broadcast frame. It's also a limited broadcast, meaning just for this network. So that means that without advanced configuration, such as DHCP relay, the DHCP servers will always be on your local area network. Next up, up is dynamic routing. Dynamic routing really means that you're using a routing protocol. Now examples of dynamic routing protocols are things like RIP and OSPF and EIGRP and stuff like that. And we'll do videos uh, for a couple of these protocols later on. But really what it means is that you're not telling the routers manually how to get to destinations. You turn on a protocol and the routers talk to each other and they figure out where all the destinations are. Now the nice thing is that static and dynamic routing can be mixed together uh, and so you have, can have a wide variety of topologies with these, these approaches to routing. Now BGP, all the way down there at the bottom of the list, has a little asterisk next to it. And that's because BGP is a little bit different than the other routing protocols listed here. It's what we call an exterior routing protocol, which means that the other ones were interior routing protocols meaning that they're used on smaller networks. So inside a company, you'll see things like OSPF and IGRP, but outside, the connectivity and the stuff that we use for the internet routing is going to be BGP. Now, one of the other things that can be also confusing is how does a router decide which route to use in its routing table? How do we decide whether or not we're actually going to add a route to a routing table? Well, the answer here for most vendors, and certainly for Cisco, which is what we're focusing on here, is going to be three values, the prefix length, the administrative distance, and the metric. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what each of these means at this point, but prefix length is really referring to the mask. So the longer the mask, the, the greater the number of ones in the mask, the longer the network match that you have. So there's a difference between, say, for example, 192.168.100.0 with a mask of 255 and the same address, 192.168.100.0 with a mask of 255, 255.255.0. .255 Those have different prefix lengths. We prefer the longer prefix length because it gets us closer to the destination. As an example, you wouldn't send a letter to a city. We'd rather send a letter to a city and a street and a house. Administrative distance is sort of a comparison between routing protocols. Not all routing protocols are created equal, and so OSPF is generally considered to be superior to RIP, for example. So OSPF has a lower administrative distance. Now, if you receive two routes from the same protocol, then the route that's closest to you, or the pathway that has the shortest distance, is going to be a better pathway. So lower metrics, given the same administrative distance and the same prefix length, are generally considered better. So that's how you sort of compare them. The first thing that we'll take is a long prefix length. The second thing to take is a low administrative distance. And the third is a short or low metric. Routing loops can happen anywhere. Uh, they happen by accidentally plugging in cables. They can happen by design. We want a loop here for redundancy. Or they can happen from misconfiguration. In this particular example, I've given you a misconfiguration. Both of these routers are pointing to each other as their own default gateway. So if you look at the routing tables, the routing tables have now changed. Each one has a default route entry pointing to the other router. So here's what happens. Let's say that we're going to try to go to a destination that is not on our network and not on the collection of networks. Uh, in this case, it might be something on the 4Net, the 5Net. The router on the left will get this packet from the node and say, I don't know where that is. Let me send it to my buddy, the next door router. That router will get it, process its routing table and say, I don't know where it is either. Let me send it right back to my default gateway. And they will bat this back and forth until the TTL field expires or is counted down to zero. 
And so there's two things that you'll see on this. You'll see command output that says TTL expired in transit, or you'll see an actual ICMP packet that says the same thing. IP version 6 routing is very similar to IP version 4. You still have routing tables, you still have masks, you still have the idea of a network address and the host specific portion. So don't freak out too bad. Uh, if you're confused about IP version 6, go watch the other videos that I made for that. I actually built a topology and showed you how it goes from uh, the ground up. There are some differences. We handle in IP version 6, we handle fragmentation differently. So the IP header has changed. We also have these giant unfamiliar addresses, so we're not really used to it. The idea of a link local, what's that all about? Uh, global unicast, what's that, that's all about? And a lot of times the gear is not configured for IP version 6, so sometimes you actually have to turn it on. There are a lot of other ideas associated with routing. We're going to touch on as many of these as we can in, the next, in this series of videos. Aggregation and summarization, that's where you collect routing table entries together to make your routing table smaller, easier to process. Discard or null routing. If you've got a whole bunch of networks and right in the middle of that address space there's one that doesn't really match, if you try to route to it, that may result in routing loops as well. So we want to have this ability to shut down those kinds of networks or at least take them out of our routing tables. Addressing on point-to-point -point links is another real big one. If I have an address space, public address space, and I don't want to use it for my point-to-point -point links, I might do um, or set up my addressing like I've done in this example here. You can see that the hosts are on the 192 address spaces, but those links in between the routers are on the 10 net. And that's one of the nice things about routing. It doesn't really matter what your addresses are. You just have to point to them. Well, that'll about do it for this one. It was actually a little longer than I expected it. Thanks very much for stopping by. The next time out, we're going to be doing that host routing video, and that'll be Chapter 2 in the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching. Remember, this one was Chapter 1, or at least an overview. You can head out to BruceRPens.com for those community configs. So if you want to build your own stuff, that's a good place to start. And don't forget that right here, we've got the Packet of the Week, uh, we got some more of those coming up and, of course, the previous networking videos. Well, thanks again for stopping by, and may your packets always reach their destinations.